a Singular Discoveries podcast. The RMS Carpathia was three days out from New York when it received a message from the White Star Liner. The 560-foot time-built Carpathia was bound for Liverpool and the Adriatic. A Cunard transatlantic steamship, it was about one-third the size of the brand-new unsinkable Titanic. The message received by 21-year-old Marconi wireless telegraph operator Harold Cottam was a cheery greeting from three sisters on the Titanic to their uncle and aunt on the Carpathia. Charlotte Appleton, Malvina Cornell and Caroline Brown, known before their marriages as the Lamson sisters, wished to tell Charles and Josephine Marshall that they were enjoying the Titanic's maiden voyage from Southampton to New York. The aunt and uncle were asleep, and the message would be held for them until the morning. That would be the 15th of April, 1912. As the clock passed midnight, Harold Cottam prepared to end his shift and go to bed. The Carpathia had only one wireless operator, so the system would be unmanned until he woke up. Cottam, from Southwell in Nottinghamshire, removed his jacket and was bending down to unlace his boots, fortunately still wearing his telephone headset, when he received an unexpected message from the Titanic. Cottam asked the liner to confirm what he was hearing, which it did. The Titanic was sinking. More than 1,500 people went down with the Titanic. But more than 700 survived. This is the story of the men, the ship, and the technology that rescued them. From Singular Discoveries, this is The Titanic Rescue. It was only a streak of luck that I got the message at all. These are the words of Harold Cottam. I had been up until 2.30 in the morning, and the night before that until 3 o'clock, and I had planned to get to bed early that night. I thought I'd take some general news, as I didn't know how the coal strike in England was going, and I was interested in it. When I had been taking this some time, there was a batch of messages coming through for the Titanic from the long-distance Marconi wireless station at Cape Cod, which transmits the day's news at 10.30 New York time every evening. The wireless telegraph system was developed by Guglielmo Marconi in the 1890s. By 1912, most transatlantic passenger ships had a Marconi system, manned by Marconi company operators like Cottam on the Carpathia and Jack Phillips and his assistant Harold Bride on the Titanic. When Cape Cod had been going for some time, he started sending the batch of messages for the Titanic. Having heard the Titanic man being pushed with work during the afternoon, I thought I'd give him a hand by taking them and retransmitting them. As I was the nearest station to the Titanic, it was more or less my duty to retransmit them. Just like wired telegraph, Wireless telegraph messages were sent in Morse code. The sender tapped the telegraph key to transmit pulses of radio waves of two different lengths, dots and dashes. The receiver heard those dots and dashes as audible beeps via a telephone headset which he could translate into text. The wireless system had a range of only a few hundred miles and multiple ships transmitted over the same frequency so channels could get jammed and messages were often missed. When Cape Cod finished, I made up my daily list of communications and reported them to the officer on watch. On returning to the cabin, I put the telephones on and called the Titanic and asked him if he was aware that a batch of messages was being transmitted for him via Cape Cod. And his answer was, Come at once. We have struck a berg. It's a CQD call, old man. CQD was the Marconi distress signal immediately recognisable to all operators. The Titanic did also send a newly established international signal. SOS. I had been on constant watch, so I was certain that she must have struck while I was on the bridge, and that was seven to ten minutes before. The Titanic's operator followed with his position. Shall I go to the captain and tell him to turn back at once? I asked. Yes, yes, came the instant reply. Cottam hurried to the bridge to inform the first officer, and the two men rushed to the captain's cabin. I can remember my door opening. This is Captain Arthur Rostron. This is an enhanced recording of his actual voice. 
I had but recently turned in and wasn't asleep, and drowsily I said to myself, Who the dickens is this cheeky beggar coming into my cabin without knocking? He had been a seaman since his early teenage years. Now 42, he had almost two decades of experience on Cunard liners. He was well respected and known for his infectious energy. His crewmates nicknamed him the Electric Spark. He didn't drink, smoke or swear, and could often be seen at the bridge lifting his cap and offering a silent prayer. Rostron was also known for his quick decision-making. The news from the Titanic snapped him awake and sprung him into action. So incredible seemed the news that, having at once given orders to turn the ship, I got hold of the Marconi operator and assured myself that there could have been no mistake. Are you sure it is the Titanic that requires immediate assistance, I asked him. Yes, sir. But I had to ask again. You are absolutely certain. For remember, the wireless was not at the pitch of perfection and reliability it is today. Quite certain. All right, I said then. Tell him we are coming along as fast as we can. It was 12.35am. The Titanic was 58 miles to the northwest. At a maximum speed of 14 knots, Rostron calculated it would take four hours to reach her. I at once worked out the course and issued orders. Within a few minutes of the call, we were steaming all we knew to the rescue. Rostron woke the chief engineer and ordered him to divert every particle of steam to the engines. While the Carpathia's 700 passengers slept, the ship raced towards the Titanic and the ice field. The captain called his officers to the bridge and issued a list of orders to ensure the ship was fully prepared for its rescue mission. The chief and first officers were to call all hands and prepare the boats, gangways and winches. The purses would receive the survivors and record their names. The ship's doctors would set up in the dining rooms to care for the sick and wounded. The stewards prepared coffee, soup and blankets. All officers' cabins, including Rostron's, were given up for the survivors. The crew would instruct any of the Carpathia's passengers who woke to remain in their cabins. And Rostron ordered signal rockets to be fired every quarter of an hour to reassure the Titanic that help was coming. All this time we were hearing the Titanic, sending her wireless out over the sea in a last call for help. We are sinking fast, was one which I picked up. The last one I received was, Come quick, our engine room is flooded up to the boilers. I answered, that we were doing our utmost to get there in time. There was no reply. I kept calling to warn them to look out for our rockets, which were being constantly sent up, but I shall never know whether he heard me or not. Captain Rostron was well aware that he was sailing the Carpathia into a perilous ice field on the blackest of nights, and he doubled the lookout. As he stood on the bridge, Rostron raised his cap and mouthed a silent prayer. At about 2.45 a.m., a lookout spotted the first large iceberg, visible thanks to the fortunate reflection of a star on its surface. And around the same time, Rostron saw a green flash in the distance. It had been about an hour since Cottam had informed Rostron that the Titanic's engine room was flooding. That hand looked fatal. It left little doubt that she was going down. So to catch that green flare brought renewed hope. More and more now, where we all keyed up, icebergs loomed up and fell astern. We never slackened, though sometimes we altered course suddenly to avoid them. It was an anxious time with the Titanic's fateful experience very close in our minds. There were 700 cells on the Carpathia. These lives, as well as the survivors of the Titanic herself, depended on a sudden turn of the wheel. Occasionally, Rostron and the lookouts glimpsed the green light. By this time, the hope that their green signals had at first bred in us was gone. There was no sign of the Titanic herself. By now, it was about 3.35 a.m., we were almost up to the position and had the giant liner been afloat, we should have seen her. The skies were clear, the stars gleaming, with that brightness which only a keen, frosty air brings to them and visibility was as good as it could be on a moonless night. At four o'clock I stopped the engines. We were there. 
The Carpathia had reached the Titanic's last known position 30 minutes faster than anticipated, at an unprecedented speed of 17 to 18 knots. Now the green light could be seen low in the water. Rostron realised it was coming from a lifeboat. He gave the order to retrieve the boat, but as the Carpathia turned, a huge iceberg loomed out of the darkness. It was necessary to move with the utmost expedition. I swung the ship round and so came alongside the first of the Titanic's boats on the starboard side. This was emergency lifeboat two, which contained around 18 survivors, including Titanic officer Joseph Boxhall. After the boat and its survivors were retrieved, Rostron had Boxhall brought to the bridge. I asked that this officer should come to me as soon as he was on board, and to him I put the heart-rending inquiry, knowing with a terrible certainty what his answer was to be. The Titanic has gone down. Yes, he said. One word that meant so much, so much that the man's voice broke on it. She went down at about 2.30. An hour and a half ago, alas, that we hadn't been nearer. But there was no time for vain regress. Daylight was just setting in, and what a sight that new day gradually revealed. Everywhere were icebergs, stretching as far as the eye could reach were masses of them. Rostron had a junior officer count the icebergs. There were 25 that reached more than 200 feet above the water, and dozens more that were 50 to 150 feet high. And amid the tragic splendour of them as they lay in the first shafts of the rising sun, boats of the last ship floated. From that moment we went on picking them up, and as the rescued came aboard, their thankfulness for safety was always mingled with the sense of their loss and the chattering cold that possessed them. The Carpathia manoeuvred through the ice field, methodically picking up the boats and bringing in the survivors using ladders, chair slings and ropes. Slowly we cruised from boat to boat, and as we neared the end of our questing, one gathered the enormity of the disaster. The lifeboats were scattered over a distance of around four miles. There was hardly any wreckage visible on the surface. The Titanic had taken almost all of its fixtures and fittings to the ocean floor. Except for the boats beside the ship and the icebergs, the sea was strangely empty. Hardly a bit of wreckage floated. Just a deck chair or two, a few life belts, a good deal of cork. No more flotsam than one could often see on a seashore drifted in by the tide. The ship had plunged at the last, taking everything with her. I saw only one body in the water. The intense cold made it hopeless for anyone to live long in it. One thing stands out in my mind about it all. The quietness. There was no noise, no hurry. At about 6am, a steward knocked on the door of the cabin of Mr and Mrs Marshall and told them that three ladies wished to see them. The uncle and aunt had slept through the commotion and were confused and dumbfounded to see their nieces standing on the Carpathia. The three lambs and sisters had escaped in the Titanic's lifeboats. Caroline was reported to be the last person placed in the crowded collapsible D, the last lifeboat to leave the Titanic, after her young cousin, Edith Evans, gave up her place, saying... You go first, you are married and have children. Edith went down with the ship. After more than four hours, the last boat was recovered. The Carpathia had rescued 706 people. One seaman died following the rescue, leaving 705 survivors. The Titanic had been carrying an estimated 2,222 people. Other ships arrived, but no one else was saved. So many hundreds lost who a few hours before had been members of a gay and distinguished company halfway through the maiden voyage of one of the world's largest liners. While we slowly cruised, we held a service in the first-class dining room in memory of those who were lost and giving thanks for those who had been saved. Then he sailed the Carpathia back to New York, negotiating ice and fog, and arriving on the night of the 18th of April amid a ferocious thunder and lightning storm. Harold Cotton manned the wireless throughout the journey, relaying messages for the survivors until he collapsed from exhaustion. 
The Titanic's junior operator, Harold Bride, assisted Cottam despite being badly injured in the wreck. Bride had survived after being swept from the deck and swimming to the overturned collapsible bee. The Titanic's senior operator, Jack Phillips, perished. Both Bride and Phillips had remained at their posts until the Titanic's telegraph room flooded. A fleet of small boats carrying relatives and pressmen swarmed around the Carpathia as she entered the harbour. Eventually, the Carpathia docked at Pier 54, the berth the Titanic never reached, and the survivors went ashore to tell the world about the fate of their unsinkable ship. And then we learned how the world had waited in suspense for details, and especially a correct and complete list of passengers and crew who had been saved. Captain Rostron was a hero before he set foot on land, although he mostly declined to speak to the press or his many subsequent passengers about the Titanic. He was awarded a Congressional Medal of Honour in the US and a knighthood in the UK. Sir Arthur Henry Rostron went on to captain the RMS Mauritania and became Commodore of the Cunard fleet. The Carpathia was torpedoed and sunk by a German U-boat in 1918. Rostron later commented, It was a sorry end to a fine ship. She had done her bit both in peace and war, and she lies in her natural element, resting her long rest on a bed of sand. Rostron died in 1940, aged 71. As for Harold Cottam, he was also a modest hero, bestowed with medals and praise but avoiding the limelight. He was initially criticised at the US Senate inquiry for failure to show, quote, proper vigilance following the incident, with the implication being that he had allowed a message to be sent stating that the Titanic passengers were all safe, something he completely denied. Guglielmo Marconi backed Cottam at the inquiry, although it was alleged that Marconi had told both Cottam and Bride to keep your mouth shut and had arranged for them to sell their stories to the press for a four-figure sum. The story of the rescue, of course, would be wonderful publicity for the Marconi company. Cottam did tell his story to the New York Times after being ambushed by a reporter shortly after docking. Cottam spoke to Marconi and received his permission. Although Cottam was not initially paid for the story, he did later receive $750, one figure short of four. And Cottam was subsequently credited as the man whose swift actions enabled the rescue of the Titanic survivors. It was clear that without Cottam, and without Marconi's wireless telegraph, all aboard would have been lost. Cottam died in 1984, aged 93. He has a blue plaque labelled Unsung Hero in his retirement village of Lodham, Nottinghamshire. His medals and paperwork were sold at auction in April 2023. In the aftermath of the Titanic inquiry, new regulations required every ship at sea to carry sufficient lifeboats to accommodate all passengers and crew. Rostron later wrote, It seems incredible that it needed this appalling calamity to bring in such a regulation. If there had been sufficient boats that night when the Titanic was lost, every soul aboard could have been saved. This was in Captain Rostron's book, Home from the Sea, which he published in 1931. The book praised Harold Cottam, although Rostron seemed to have forgotten his name. My late passengers can now read of the things I would never talk about, he wrote, and I would mention that it was the wireless officer on the Carpathia, through his attention to duty and his interest in his work, that I am indebted for the opportunity to do something really useful, and it was then that I got my feet firmly planted on the ladder of success. Finally, to end this episode, the words of another captain, Captain Edward John Smith, interviewed in 1907, five years before he took command of the Titanic. When anyone asks me how I can best describe my experiences of nearly 40 years at sea, I merely say, uneventful. I have never been in an accident of any sort worth speaking about. I never saw a wreck and have never been wrecked nor was I ever in any predicament that threatened to end in disaster of any sort. Captain Smith, of course, went down with his ship. In the next episode of Singular Discoveries, another true story from the forgotten corners of history. To receive new episodes for free, just follow Singular Discoveries on Apple, Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. 
If you'd like to binge listen the entire season ad-free right now, just go to singulardiscoveries.com. The Titanic Rescue was written and produced by Paul Brown. You can find more of his writing at stuffbypaulbrown.com. Singulardiscoveries.com. 